So good morning, Hollywood Community Church. Um, my name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hollywood Community Church for all the people that are here for the first time. If you are here for the first time, we say welcome to each of you. We're glad you are here this morning. So give all of our visitors a welcome this morning for hanging out with us. And just a little plug, if you have not received a gift for being here for the first time, please stop on the way out at a table right out front and get a gift from us just for you. So how many of you would agree that we live in a fast-paced society, right? Especially in South Florida. In South Florida, people always say that it is one of the fastest paced. And people always wonder, what makes South Florida so fast? Here's what it is. You will agree with me, it is expensive to live down here in South Florida, right? So we basically have to work 100 hours a week just to afford a one bedroom apartment, right? So we're constantly working, we're constantly stressed, we're running around trying to do everything, and so our life gets fast, and as human beings, our society has come up with some time-saving tools. Right, because we're all trying to figure out how can I do things quickly so I don't have to spend all my time, because I gotta spend my time working myself so I can pay for my one bedroom apartment. And so our world has developed some cool things. Like there are some inventions that totally make sense, like a microwave. How many of you enjoy your microwave? It's amazing, you, your leftovers from the night before, you just put in the microwave, you can set it to go for like an hour, you can run around and you can take a nap, and that's probably why my leftovers come out terrible, right Kelly? So. I wouldn't recommend that, but microwaves make our lives easier. You can have popcorn really fast. Washer and dryer, aren't you glad we don't have to wash it in a river or a canal in Florida, right? Aren't you glad we have had that invention in place? Now, cars, I don't know about you, but I don't want to ride a donkey or a cow or a camel or a horse or any of those things to get where I need to go or walk. I'm too lazy for that. So I'm glad cars were invented. And why did we invent cars? To save us time. Now, I can understand, too, this one makes sense, computers. Instead of having to write with the pencil, where you ever get the hand cramp when you're writing too long? Computer, you don't have to get that. Now you just get carpal tunnel syndrome and everything is good. But computers make our lives easier. Now, I did, I did a little research because I'm like, I've seen some really ridiculous things to try to save us time. And it's some of these things where it's like, really? Like, this is where we're going now with some silly things? So I'll put the first one up here for you. A toothpaste dispenser. I'm too busy, I can't even squeeze the tube. Like, who, how is it that hard to go and get the toothpaste on your tube? Or what about this one? I have a cat, so this one makes sense. A self-scooping litter box, ooh. I don't have to scoop the poo, I just leave it, it does it all on its own. Now, I was actually at the pet store, and I looked at the price of one of these things, like what, this would save me some time. Like, two minutes out of my week, okay? And I'm like, this could save me some time. And I look at it, $100 for this self-scooping litter box. I said, uh, give me the scoop, I'm gonna scoop the poo myself for $100. But here's the thing, there was a moment where I literally thought about, ooh, I need this invention in my life. But I really didn't. Here's the next thing, how about for all those people that enjoy theme parks? You have to wait, yes, mm-hmm. And you go to these rides that you want to go on, and there's like a 75-minute wait. But don't worry, guys. Since we don't like to wait, Universal has done an amazing thing. They have made an express pass, a fast pass, so you could skip the line and get right onto your death ride, right? And so we have a problem with waiting. Or this next one, you all been at Publix, and you look at the long lines, and then we all go to this one, the express lane. 10 items or less. And you ever been in that moment where you had 11 and you were like, ah, I really don't need the napkins. And you throw the napkins back. You don't have time to wait. So you get right in the express lane, right? Or now this is for, my wife loves to do this, is Amazon Prime. And this microphone is climbing my head. I apologize, guys. Give me a second here. Um, Amazon Prime. Where now you don't even have to fight the crowds at the mall. You could just order it online. And not only that, not only can they ship it to you in three to five business days, but now you can do two-day shipping where you can get it in two days so we don't have to wait for our packages. This is a world we live in. And for all our young people and all that stuff, there's another one where we don't like to have conversations anymore. So somebody made an app and said, instead of like having a real conversation, let's just do Snapchats. Let's just make it snappy and in a hurry. And so I have a little video from that. So go. So here's the thing. 
I'm really super busy. I don't have time to have conversations. So you know what I do? I just give a quick Snapchat because long conversations, I hate them. So here we have Snapchat. We don't even like to have long conversations. We want to send things very short. Hey, how you doing? Have a good day. Bye. And that's it. And here's the problem we have in our society is that we live in a world that wants things right now. All of us, and you can say, oh, that's just the young people. No, all of us in this room that is here and in the world all struggle with wanting what we want and wanting it now. We all struggle with delayed gratification where it's like, I know I should probably wait on this, but I can't, so I'm going to do whatever I can to get it now. And when we run into the struggle where we want things now, here's what happens. We get into trouble emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and we wonder what is happening to our lives. Now, you might be sitting back thinking, okay, Brad, what does this idea of not liking to wait have to do with anything to do with Exodus and our series? Well, you see, it's not just us that has this problem. We bring the same mentality of not wanting to wait into our spiritual lives. We don't like to wait, even spiritually. At many points in our life, we feel that God is not working his plan out on our time or on our terms. And we begin to get frustrated when God doesn't act quickly enough for us. We sit back and say, God, your promises say that I am going to experience freedom. It's not here, God, so I'm going to take it into my own hands to experience freedom for myself. And we do things on our own. So this morning, we're going to look at the story of the golden calf and see how this idea of not liking to wait plays out. And as we go through this message this morning, here's what I want you to remember as we walk through it. God's promises are greater than our failures. Y'all with me this morning? God's promises are greater than our failures. Our passage this morning is found in Exodus chapter 32, and it's verses 1 through 35. And I'm not going to read all verses 1 through 35 to you, and we're going to dissect just a few. And I would really encourage you to just go home later and at another time, maybe today or maybe this week, and if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty details of this passage, dig into it on your own. We're going to take in as in this morning, and I'm not going to touch everything that is, is in here this morning. So this, this passage this morning in Exodus 32 tells the story of the golden calf. And for those of you that have been a Christian for a long time, you have heard this story. But there might be some of us in here this morning that have never heard the story of this golden calf. And why is there a golden cow in the Bible? What does this have to do with anything? Well, let me set the context for you. What has happened in chapters 30 through 32 up to this point, God has told Moses, look, I am going to bring my presence to your people Israel. And I'm going to dwell with you once again like was my plan from the beginning. And I'm going to give you instructions to build me a tabernacle, a temple where my presence could dwell with you. Where you would be my people of kings and priests and I would be your God and I will dwell with you. And so he calls Moses up on a mountain onto Mount Sinai and says, I'm going to give you the law. You see, just how I have loved you, I'm going to give you these laws so that you can go out and be the same kind of people that I am. And so Moses is up on the mountain, and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And Israel is down on the bottom of the mountain thinking, uh, God, why is this taking so long? When are your promises going to come? So Moses was delaying. The people run up to Aaron, the high priest, and they say, Aaron, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. He might have died. I don't know, but we need to get this show on the road. You need to make us a God and bring God here so that we can worship these gods who have brought us out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron, not wanting to upset the people, says, give me all of your gold. So all the people, men, women, children, wherever they were gold, was gold, brought all their gold to Aaron. Aaron took the gold, he melted it, and then formed a golden calf out of it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw how the people began to worship this golden calf and began to worship it, he said, you know what? Tomorrow, Israel, we're going to hold a feast to the Lord. So come ready tomorrow to worship and to sacrifice to this golden calf. 
While this is happening, the next day, Israel comes out. They offer sacrifices to the idol. And God looks at Moses and tells Moses, your people have sinned. They began to worship a false idol. And he told Moses because of their sin, their idolatry, he was going to destroy them, obliterate them, wipe them off the face of the planet. Moses immediately pleads with God and he says, God, you need to spare your people Israel. Look, God, I know you're really upset with them, but remember, if you just destroy them now, all the Egyptians that you just defeated, they're going to look at you and say, you couldn't even spare them in the wilderness. God, you need to, for, for your glory, God, spare Israel. For your honor, spare them. And he says, God, remember the covenant that you made with Abraham and Isaac for your promise, God, don't destroy them. And the scriptures say that the Lord hears Moses' prayer and relented from the disaster he was going to send on them. Moses returns from the mountain and he hears this singing. And the singing was kind of like maybe it could have been a battle cry. And Joshua walks up and says, Moses, there's this singing. And I know we didn't just fight a battle, but something's going on. There's some kind of singing. And Moses comes down and he hears that it's the people singing a song of, 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 of worship and pro- declaring that this idol has come and God is now going to give them all the promises that he had promised. So he comes down, takes the two tablets, breaks them on the ground, telling Israel, God's covenant is broken. All of his promises, they're broken. What have you done, Israel? And he calls Aaron over to him and he says, Aaron, dude, you are the high priest. I know they must have threatened your family. They must have done something to you. How could you let this happen? And Aaron goes, well, Moses, you know your people, they're really evil. They're complainers, they're obstinate, and they came to me so here, Moses, I don't know, I just took the gold, I threw it in the fire, and this little calf came out of the fire. Moses looks at Israel and he says, look, everyone who is on the Lord's side, come to me. And it said, all the sons of Levi came over to, to Moses. And then Moses looked at each of them and said, put a sword on your side, and I want you to go out and I want you to put to death everybody who worshiped this golden calf. Kill son, father, brother, sister, mother, whoever worshiped. And the scriptures say 3,000 people fell that day. The next day Moses tells the remaining Israelites, he says, look, I'm gonna go up on this mountain on your behalf and I'm gonna plead with God that he would spare us, that he would not destroy us. He goes up there, he speaks to God, and God tells Moses, you know what, Moses, I'm not going to destroy the remaining people. I will preserve them, but I will punish them. And later, at the end of the chapter, you see that God later sends a plague. We don't know what happened with the plague. We don't know if people died, but God brought his justice to the people. And so this morning, that's the story. That's Exodus chapter 32. And a lot of sermons and teachings on this text have focused on this question, what golden calves are in your lives? For those of you that have been in church for a while, have you heard that sermon before? You've heard them say, identify the idols in your life and then come lay them at the altar. We've, those who have been in church, we've, we, we've, we've heard those. And today my goal is not for you to identify your idols. That's important. That's super important. That's good to do it in your life when you realize that there's something that has more of a priority in your life. And that's good. It's good to identify. But today, I want us to get to the motive behind the idols. Because there is something inside each of us that causes us to have idols. And so we're going to focus on that motive to really determine how we can, what, how we can keep these idols from coming out. And so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little illustration here to kind of explain what I'm meaning. How many of you have been sick recently? Anybody been sick? Okay. I've been sick. Now, everybody that raised your hand, the people that probably shook it are looking around like, uh, where can I find hand sanitizer? But I've been sick this week, and on Thursday, I literally woke up and felt like a fat elephant was sitting on my face. Anybody ever been there with me? Okay. So... It was this horrible pain, and I was like, man, I got a headache, I feel horrible, so I need to quickly grab some DayQuil. Now, this liquid right here is, is it, has anybody ever tasted this? It's terrible. It is the worst. This company, DayQuil, 
doesn't even hide the fact that it tastes horrible. Like the flavor on here says medicine. It doesn't even say berry or cherry. It's just medicine. And I took this and I'm like, uh, and I'm gagging for like the next two minutes because it's like, uh, uh, in the aftertaste. And I took this and I was like, okay, I'm going to start to feel better. Four hours later, I'm like, I feel no better. I feel no better at all. So I took my second dose, and I'm like, okay, now I should start to feel better. I felt no better. And that's how you know you're really sick, is when DayQuil, the cold is like, ha I'm not going anywhere. Thanks for tickling me. And as the day got on, I got worse. Because here's the thing. DayQuil is only created to achieve one purpose, to attack your symptoms. You could drink the whole bottle and it will never take care of the problem that is in your body. This is just to mask the symptoms. It doesn't take care of the actual infection or the virus. All this does is to try to make you feel better about yourself, like, oh, I'm feeling better. And it's like, no, you're not. We're just gonna mask your symptoms until your body gets rid of the root cause. You see, this morning, here's what I want us to catch. So many times we focus and say, I have the idol of anger in my life, so I'm just going to focus on not being angry, and we focus on the symptom. We focus on the fruit of what's in our life, but the fruit is only the result of the root problem, the cause of it all. You see, the root determines the fruit in our life. If the root is bad, your fruit will be bad bad. And so this morning, yes, there are results and fruit that you can see in your life that are like, man, these are idols in my life. But today I want to look at what is the motive that causes our roots to be infected and diseased, and what can we do about it? You see, to take care of our idolatry, We have to attack the root cause. And what is the root cause of our idolatry? Here's the first thing I put in my notes. We fail when we attempt to fulfill God's promises through the flesh. In other words, we fail, idols come in, when we say, God, I know what you promised, but I'm going to bring your promises about my own way through the flesh. See, look with me in verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I know that was a lot of words and a lot of information at one time, but I'll boil it down to this. How do these verses show that Israel was trying to not wait on God's promises? Here's what it is. God made Abraham a promise in Genesis chapter 12, and he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your nation so big, Abraham, that you're going to then be a blessing to other so that all the other nations in the world will know that I'm your God and they will bring praise and glory to me because I'm going to bless you so mightily. Then God tells Moses, Moses, I'm going to use you to bring your people out of Egypt and I'm going to bring you into the promised land where you will finally find rest. And in this rest, I will be your God and you will be my kingdom of priests reflecting praise and glory back to me. You see, Israel's impatience was here because they were waiting for the rest. They wanted it. Have you ever been in a place where you sat back and said, God, I want your rest. Like, life is tough. Life is a struggle. This was Israel. They were so close. They're like, God set us free. We're about to enter the promised land. God, 
Why are you taking so long? And they became impatient. Moses leaves for 40 days and 40 nights, and every day that goes by, Israel became more and more impatient. And when God finally seemed like he was distant, when God finally seemed like he wasn't working, they said, that's it, Aaron, make us a golden calf because, God, you're taking too long to fulfill your promises, so we're going to force you to do that. And they made a golden calf. Now, here's literally what Israel was doing with that golden calf. Sometimes we immediately think that they took the golden calf and it was instant idol worship. It wasn't. You see, when God told Israel to make the Ark of the Covenant, on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a mercy seat. And when God would fill the temple, that is where God's presence would stand and his presence would be with his people. The golden calf, the golden cow was the same imagery for gods during this time, that the bull, the top of the cow, would wear a God would come and stand and his presence would be there. So here's Israel is telling Aaron, Aaron, God's taking so long, too long, so we want you to make this calf because we're demanding that God's presence comes now. And they made the golden calf to bring God's presence to them. And not too much longer after that, they began to do idol worship. And catch this, Moses is getting the law on the mountain, you shall have no other gods before me. And before the tablets could even come down with that, Israel broke that commandment. And then it says they went up and they ate and they drank and they engaged in sensual play. And they ended up breaking all of the commandments before the law was ever given to them. And why is that? because they wanted God to act on his time and fulfill his promises on their time. You see, this is, Israel was not the first mistake. If you read the story of Abraham, Abraham received the promises of God, and God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, and guess what? I know your wife is really old. She's 90 plus. I won't really say her age. I don't want to offend her. And so, but she's going to have a baby. And Abraham's like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, are you sure about that? Well, they said, God, we trust you. My wife's going to have a baby. Time went by. The baby didn't show up. God, where's your promise? God, we don't see it yet. Finally, they get impatient enough, and and Sarah tells Abraham, Abraham, you know what? Let's make this baby thing happen. Go take the maidservant. Have her have a baby with you, and we're going to call everything good, and the promise is going to be here. So he goes, he does that, they have a baby, the baby's name is Ishmael, and then God visits Abraham and says, Abraham, that's not how I work. My promises come in my time, on my terms. And he said, because you've done that, yes, there's consequences. Yes, Ishmael is your son, but, but, most, but, but Abraham, catch this, I will make him a great nation, however... The sword will never leave his family, meaning he will always be fighting. There will always be death. He will always be attacking my promised people because you have chosen to fulfill my promise through the flesh. And consequences were brought into Abraham's life. You see, God's promises do not come ever through the flesh. When we seek to fulfill God's promises through the flesh, it leads to this, sin and God's punishment and discipline in our life. Now, all of us in here, we struggle with the same temptation. We all do it. We very easily try to fulfill God's promises through the flesh all the time. And when it does, when we do that, it leads us down a path of sin and God's discipline. And so this morning you might be sitting back saying, well, how do we do that today? How do we actually try to fulfill God's promises through the flesh today? Well, I'll give you some examples. God has given to us the gift of sex. Yet we tell ourselves, God doesn't really confine sex to marriage. I can have sex outside of marriage, or I can even be married and have sex with someone else who is not my spouse because I want that promise now. God has promised to provide for us, but catch this, we hold back on giving, God, giving money to God's work 
because we feel like, well, no, I got to make sure my bank account's full. I got to make sure I have a savings. I got to make sure I have a retirement. And if I start giving to God's work, then I'm, I'm going to be financially broke. And so we say, yeah, we want God's provision, but yet then we try to handle our finances on our own. And then we sit back and go, God, why aren't you blessing? And God says, I don't work through the flesh. I work through my promise on my terms. You see, some of us, we, we have enemies that enter our life, and we know that God says in his word that he will get vengeance, revenge is the Lord, yet we take matters into our own hands. We get impatient, and so we get revenge through slandering, cussing people out, gossiping about them, or arguing with them because we become impatient. God has promised to be our joy, Yet we want joy now, so what do we do? We hit alcohol, we turn to drugs, we go to pornography because we want temporary joy and are impatient. You see, even the church, pastors, church staff, we are guilty of doing the same thing. How's that? Well, God has promised that he will build his kingdom. Yet many churches and ministries are found by people who will use guilt, shame, legalistic rules, competition, and intimidation to build their own kingdom because that's not how God builds his kingdom. And not being able to wait affects all of us at all times. There's even parents who God says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn away from it. Yet how many parents exasperate their children and beat the Bible over their head to try to get obedience and demand that spiritual growth in their life? You cannot fulfill God's promises through the flesh because catch this, the wrath of man never fulfills the promises of God. Never, ever. Our failure, idolatry happens in our life because we are not willing to wait on God's promises. And then we bring bring sin and shame into our lives. And every idol that appears appears in our life because we are not satisfied with God's plan and God's purposes in our life. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you waited on a promise of God? Have you ever had, you ever been in that season where you waited for the promise of God and then it came? Because see, so many times we become impatient and we focus on these idols, but really what we need to learn to do is remember how God has worked through his promise, even if that promise seemed like it was slacking or delayed. Because when you've ever waited on God, and there is beauty in the waiting room, folks, But so many of us are like, I don't want the waiting room. But the waiting room is where you grow. The waiting room is where you say, God, it is on you, not me. And we try to skip the waiting room, but the waiting room is part of the process. You see, my wife and I shared a while ago how we ran ourselves ragged trying to have a baby. And we were doing every medicine I was putting on testosterone, I was taking pills, I was taking this little disgusting powder drink in the morning, and I was like, ah, we're going to have a baby, we're going to have a baby. Then test after test, it's like, nope, nope, you're not, you're not. Then it was like, your condition's getting worse and worse, and finally my wife and I were like, okay, this is crazy, there's chaos, there's, my life is going insane right now, so my wife and I decided, man, we need peace in our life. So you know what we did? We said, you know what, forget all this medicine. Forget all this stuff on my own. We need to focus on God's plan. And we said, you know what? We need peace. So here's what we're going to do. Here's going to be our prayer. God, if you will, yes. God, if you don't will, yes. And let it be. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. That waiting room, since we made that decision... There's there's a verse in Isaiah that has never been more real to me than walking this journey. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let me tell you, the moment we say, God, we're waiting on you, my wife and I are now soaring because the weight of trying to do this in our own terms took our focus off on what God had called us to do. And now with that weight gone, we are free to soar. We are free to run. And when we walk, when we run, when we fly all around, we're not exhausted spiritually because we're saying, God, this is in your hands and we're operating on your time and your purpose for your promises to be fulfilled and we're not doing it on our own. But here's the reality. There are so many people who are trying to fulfill God's promises through the flesh that when they soar, they're exhausted. When they run, they're exhausted. Even when they walk, they're exhausted. Because you can never fulfill God's promises through the flesh. God is the only one who will fulfill his promises. You see, to get to the root of the problem, we must begin to wait on the Lord. How's that? Trust in his plan, not yours, to fulfill his promises. As you wait on the Lord, here's what you'll see. You will find rest. You will have peace. And you will have supernatural strength to do what God has called you to do. Here's the second thing I put in my notes. It's this. God keeps his promises despite our failures. God keeps his promises despite our failures. See, so many times we sit down to read the Old Testament and we have the wrong perspective of the Old Testament. We sit down and we we look at it as it's all law and it's not important. And we think Jesus is the, the way So let's just read the New Testament and the Old Testament, kind of just throw it to the side. But here's what the Old Testament, here's what the writer of Exodus is wanting us to grasp through the story of the golden calf. It is a tension that is all throughout the Old Testament. It's this, man fails to obey God and keep his law. That is what you see over and over again in the Old Testament. And you see, why do we keep seeing it over and over? Hello, that's the author trying to get us to see something. That is God trying to get us to see the picture of our human condition. All of us at our core fail to obey God and keep his law. And this is why God puts it here in his word with the golden calf. God has called the people to himself He promises to dwell with them. Then they disobey him. They break his law. God has to punish them. God has to restore them. Then God adds more laws to their life. Then you see man falls. God punishes. God restores. God adds more laws. This is all throughout the Old Testament. When you look at Aaron in this passage, you'll see. You look at chapter 33, right? It comes right after this. Aaron, the high priest sinned by making that golden calf. And God, what does God do? He punishes Israel, he restores them, and then what does he do? He adds the high priest or the priestly codes, priestly laws. Now God says, okay, now that my high priest, now that the one who is supposed to be serving me has sinned, I now have a bunch of laws for them to follow. God punishes them, restores them, and adds more laws. We might sit back and say, why does God keep adding laws? What's the point of adding laws every time God's people sin and restored? Here's what it goes back to. God is preserving his people until the promised seed comes to earth to make everything right. How's that, Brad? Well, you go back to Genesis. God creates this beautiful world creates this beautiful garden where God says, I am going to bring my presence from heaven to earth. And I am going to dwell with my most prized creation, which is mankind. And I'm going to dwell with them. So God comes down. He makes the place just for them. He gives them a purpose. He says, go out, be fruitful, multiply, rule over my creation, reflect praise and glory back to me. And immediately Adam and Eve say, you know what? I know God told us not to eat this fruit, but we want to be just like God. We don't want to wait for anything special to happen. They take the fruit. 
they eat it, they disobey, the covenant is broken, they're kicked out of Eden. But here's the beauty of God, and this is what I want you to catch this morning, because remember, God's promises are greater than our failures. Because the beauty of God didn't say, I'm wiping them off the face, I'm turning them into sheep, and I'm starting over. He doesn't do that. He restores them, he punishes them, he restores them, and then tells them in Genesis 3.15, look guys, I know you messed up, but there is going to come a promised seed who will make everything right. He will destroy sin, he will destroy Satan, and he will make everything right. My promised seed is coming. So as you read the Old Testament, you're looking, when is this person coming? So every person that comes on the scene as you read the Old Testament, is this the one? Abraham comes, is Abraham the one? Abraham's not the one. Is Moses the one, the great deliverer of God's people? Moses comes up and he fails. He doesn't even get to enter the promised land. Then you get to King David, a man after God's own heart. Surely he's the promised one. David comes, commits adultery and murder. David is not the promised seed. Then you have his son who was born, King Solomon, the wisest king in all the world ever, and you think, surely Solomon is the one, but Solomon falls into idolatry, and Solomon is not the one. And all throughout Scripture, man keeps failing over and over and over again. You see, here's the point the Old Testament is making. Man, me, you, are incapable of fulfilling God's loss. All of us have failed to measure up to God's loss. God says even our best are filthy rags apart from God. There is no way that we can keep and fulfill God's laws on our own. You will never enter God's family through good works. We are incapable, we all have sinned, and just like Israel, we all have become lawbreakers. And this is the conclusion the writer of Exodus wants us to arrive at. He wants us to think about these questions. Well, if man is falling and failing, what is God going to do about it? How is God going to make it right if man can't keep the law? This is where the beauty and love of God comes in. Look with me at Exodus 32, 11 through 14. It says, But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, With evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. In all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And catch this, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Why did God relent? God did not relent because Israel deserved it. God relented for his glory, for his honor, and for his promises to his people. You see, we can never deserve God's grace. We can never earn God's grace. It is only through what God has done for us that we can experience God's grace in our lives. You see, Galatians 3.19, it teaches us a truth. God knows that all of us fail. And when he added the laws, every time man disobeyed, he was doing it to preserve it for the one who was promised to come. Galatians 3.19 says this, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So how did God put the world to right when man keeps falling? Here's what God did. He sent his one and only son into the world. And Jesus became the true Israel where he lived obediently 
and fulfilled every law of God. It says in Scripture that he was obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Why? Because he knew us, his creation, do nothing but fail. But God knew that his promises are greater than our failures. Because what we couldn't do through the flesh, God did through his son, Jesus Christ. So that, catch this, all who put their faith in him, we fulfill the law, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. How's that? Romans 8, 3 through 4 says this. For what God has done, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now catch this, verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Did you catch that? Through faith in Christ, the requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. We never fulfill it in our own strength, but only in faith in Jesus Christ. Each of us this morning, our root problem is this. We don't like to wait on God's promises to be fulfilled. And in any moment that we try to force God's hand, sin comes in, which will lead to idolatry and will lead to whatever those fruits are. And this morning, you have to get to the root cause. And I know some of us in here might be thinking, well, Brad, what's wrong with me? I, I, I have faith in Christ. I believe in him. I want to honor him. I want to love him. But Brad, I keep falling. What is wrong with me? This morning, I want to encourage your heart. Because God has had to encourage my heart because the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, struggled with this very same thing. You might say, what? The Apostle Paul struggled with this? Yeah, I, I want to read it to you in his own words. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Has anybody been there? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I've been there, constant. For I delight in the law of God. I do in my inner being. I love God. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a question we're all asking this morning. Who can make it right? Here's Paul's answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Only Jesus can make right what is wrong in our life. Only Jesus can calm the sin that is within me. Only Jesus can allow me to live and honor him with my life. You see, I want... I want you to bow your hearts this morning. And in just a moment, the worship team is going to sing. 
And this is going to be an opportunity for you. The altar will be open. Because many of us, we've been struggling with some of these idols that keep appearing because we never get to the root. We never just come to the altar and say, Jesus, and sit at his feet and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I'm broken. I constantly fail. And it's only by you coming to him and saying, Jesus, I need you to do what I can't. I need you to change me. I need you to work in my life. You see, some of us have to do business with God to attack the root. Because I'll tell you, that fruit will never go away until you get to the root. And once you get the root, when Jesus Christ is the answer in your life, he'll begin to change you, and you'll begin to see the fruit change. But it's not done in your strength and your power. It's done through Christ's power. Some of us, we may have never called out to Christ and said, Jesus, you're my Savior. What do I do? It's, it's you admitting today, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. My life is broken and busted. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And when we, you begin to wait on God's promises, you will see your fruit change. And you will greater understand that God's promises are greater than our failures. And you can bring that same message of hope to others.